Okay. So, uh, welcome worldwide to everybody to this eighth event uh, of the Robotics Global Colloquia organized by the International Federation of Robotics Research. And uh, my name is uh, Alessandro Beluca uh, from the Sapienza University of Rome in Italy. And I have the pleasure to introduce today uh, our speaker and to moderate the discussion. And uh, our speaker today will be uh, Professor Sami Hadadin uh, from the Technical University of Munich uh, in Germany. And he will talk about tactile robots and the subtitle is safe, sensitive and capable to learn. So we will hear uh, probably uh, why robots, why and how robots need to have uh, an interaction with human and with the environment, which is both safe and sensitive. And there has been uh, quite recently a few breakthroughs uh, that allows uh, good hope to have new generation of robots, uh, both in industrial application and in service, professional service and domestic application, uh, in which there is a, a conjunction of different technologies uh, certainly uh, a human-centered robot design, and we'll, we'll hear about a few things from uh, Samia Dadin, tactile control and uh, physics-based machine learning. At least these are three highlights of uh, what we will uh, listen to today. So uh, uh, let me introduce, uh, sorry, let me introduce a uh, uh, few highlights from the curriculum of uh, our speaker, Professor Samia Dadin is the director of the Munich School of Robotics and Machine Intelligence at the Technical University of Munich since uh, its uh, birth, so in 2018. Uh, he took a PhD in Germany at the Rheinisch Westfalisch uh, uh, Technische Hochschule in uh, Aachen in 2011, so nine years ago. Uh, he was a researcher before and after at DLR, uh, visited several laboratories in the, in the world, and then became a, a, a chair professor at the University of Hanover, which is also the uh, hometown of his family. His research interest spans several aspects. We will uh, listen to some of them today. So robot design and control, uh, collective intelligence, certainly safe human robot interaction uh, with a, a the light on uh, uh, neuromechanics of humans and the prosthetic, intelligent prosthetic. Uh, Sami has received many, many awards, starting with a European PhD award uh, for his thesis, uh, named after Georges Giralt in 2012. Uh, he was twice awarded with the best transaction favor in robotics, IEEE transaction. Uh, received an early career award from IEEE and from the RSS conference. and. Uh, I mean, this is in growing uh, uh, importance and relevance. He received the German Future Prize of the Federal President in 2017 and the uh, uh, very uh, important Leibniz Prize uh, last year. Uh, he's also involved in a number of European Commission, now the, the expert group on AI uh, since 2018. Uh, and uh, as we will uh, listen also, uh, he has been the founder of Frank and Mika with the uh, famous Panda Robots in 2016. He holds more than 30,000 patents. And last but not least, he's a great guitar player. And I know this in person. So uh, uh, today with us, uh, we have also five uh, colleagues uh, in a panel that will help me to go through and to interact uh, with Sami and uh, his presentation. Uh, let me present them in the order, alphabetic order. We have uh, Andrea Bajis, uh, sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, she's a, a senior PhD student from the University of California in Berkeley. And her interests are really in human-robot interaction and uh, uh, mainly in the prediction of human mo motion in, robust, uh, in a robust way and of, of course, and design of safe uh, motion planner in the presence of humans. Uh, then we have Cosimo della Santina, uh, he is currently at the Delft Technical University in the Netherlands, 
and he uh, took his PhD in 2018, uh, and his main research area is soft robotics. Um, then we have Calogero Oddo from the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, he's associate professor there uh, in Pisa, and he's really at the confluence between biorobotics and neuroscience, and has a lot of expertise in uh, tactile sensing. Uh, then we have Jayung Park from the uh, Seoul National University in Korea. Uh, he's an expert in human robot interaction and multi contact force control. Uh, and finally, uh, Michael Wang from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology in China. Uh, he's also the current editor in chief of the IEEE transaction on automation science and engineering. And uh, among the many too, too long expertise, I would uh, single out that is um, uh, very good at multidisciplinary design and optimization. So each of these discussions have some intersection with uh, Sami's uh, talk, and this is why uh, we are very glad that they are here. Uh, I conclude with a few indications. So uh, the talk will be divided in three segments. So we will uh, pause after uh, each of these, and there will be Q&A uh, uh, session, small, and then we have a longer discussion at the end. So I will pose the question, uh, of course, uh, help with the panelists that can stop Sammy at any time. Uh, and I will also collect uh, the question that you can submit through the Slido application, um, and we'll present them uh, at the right time. So please be patient. I, may combine some of these questions if there are too many or whatever. So that's it. Uh, I'm very uh, glad that uh, Sami will give the talk today. So I will uh, stop my sharing. Uh, okay. 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 So does everybody hear me? Is it okay, the sound? Okay, wonderful. All right, thanks a lot. And thanks so much, Alessandro, for, for this introduction. And uh, I'm very glad that, uh, that you appreciate uh, my, my ever decreasing guitar playing. I, I still love to do it <laughs> once in a while, but unfortunately the razors have, been, uh, have not been coming together so much anymore. So we, we need to continue on that at some point. So um, thanks uh, for having me here, um, also to Osama to, to, to invite me to this wonderful um, robotics colloquia. It's a great honor, and I'm I hope I can I can um, share some some views with you. Um, I guess we have like uh, as Alessandro said, up uh, 40 minutes for for the presentation. I will stop in between uh, deliberately twice, and uh, and uh, would love to take uh, the questions from from. Cosimo, Michael, uh, Calogero, and uh, Jay Hung and Andrea. So thanks also for for joining and and uh, giving me probably a hard time. I heard this is the job and uh, looking forward to that. So let me just start right away with with uh, what I wanted to, to talk about today um, a little bit. Um, I guess we all have seen, um, and this is nothing new to this community, obviously, but I think it's always good to to re restate this just to make sure where we are most of the time in industry still. So many of the robots that have been deployed over the, the, the last decades, the several hundred thousands a year, um, are typically doing all these things we, we already know of for quite some time. So spot welding and painting, being segregated from humans. So we see this picture is well known, the single human here on the, on the upper left that is segregated uh, in, uh, from the human uh, workspace. So there is no physical human role interaction going on. And many of the things I'm gonna uh, tell, tell you about today are also uh, inspired and, and have been also originated in the work that uh, I was able to do with Alessandro when I was still a student at TUM in, in Munich. And he was at DLR back then as a Humboldt fellow. And I had the pleasure to, to learn from him a lot of things. So um, I guess many of, uh, of the aspects that today are coming are really inspired from this very early interaction. And uh, still kind of uh, gave, me, gave me very nice uh, ideas over the many years to, to, to still depart from. So, uh, but this picture kind of is very um, 
I think clearly pointing out that in the broad sense, we still are in the early phase of automation, one could say. And there has been lots of tremendous uh, progress in automation and we all know, and this is just a, an overview of many of the systems that have been starting from the Unimate, maybe Gargantua before, towards all the industrial robotic systems, um, the, the great work back then at Stanford and MIT regarding Puma and the, and the Stanford arm and the controls uh, b uh, back then developed. The large um, industrial impact of uh, various uh, kinematics in, in uh, standard robotics, we all know position control devices, and they really uh, having been done a lot of um, kind of uh, uh, impact in, in industry in modern automation. And uh, over the course of action from, let's say, 10 years ago in industrial uh, um, implica uh, implications or industrial use, more and more systems have been developed that uh, to some extent allowed interaction with the world, um, at least uh, some coexistence with humans. Um, for example, the uni Universal Robot Series, uh, Rethink Robotics, the, depart uh, the, the systems from KUKA, the KUKA EVA, which we have been back then in my time at DLR um, involved in the uh, technology transfer from the pioneering work of Gerd Hilzinger, Mechatronics, and then myself also um, needing to, to, to found a company called Franca and Mika that then uh, tried to take these uh, systems with a sense of touch towards the next level and hoping to, to kind of impact um, the, the and, and, and opening up for a new way of, of uh, automation industry. However, I think it's clear that, that we have not only had some, some, some dreams and uh, hopes that this technology of tactile robots, robots with a sense of touch, are only left in labs, but really coming to reality. And something that I personally was, was kind of quite proud of was that uh, the Franca systems we've been developing, and uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this as well, um, were designed in a way not only to, to be collaborative and tactile, being enabled of, of manipulation capabilities for famous peg and hold problems and things like that but also one of the core design principles was that these systems were designed to be manufactured together with humans so human robot collaboration being part of the design process of the system and in some sense this was kind of interesting because this robot was designed for mass production and in the end the human and the robot together were able to do these uh, steps in some sense with with uh, manufacturing capabilities that have not been there before, uh, at least not on, on this scale, and were able to then uh, build a mass manufacturing um, facility, um, even at an economic level at, in Germany, which typically for such mechatronic uh, electronics products was not uh, so much possible anymore. So really showing that humans and robots can become a team, collaboration being at the core, but also the sense of touch, the safe interaction, and in particular, the capabilities to do all kinds of um, assembly and manufacturing tasks that needed a delicate sense of touch and according control means that I'm gonna talk about today also to some extent. I think we all know that this sense of touch of humans and here I always show my little daughter uh, many, many years ago when she was, uh, when she was uh, making a big mess in our living room. And I asked, uh, you know, I was doing some, some uh, thoughts about how could we connect nonlinear control, impedance control and learning adaptation with, with, with machine learning and uh, kind of trying to, to do some experiments with my kids. So three kids I have, and, and I always try to, to kind of stimulate uh, their, their curiosity to do some challenging tasks and then learning. So what would be the benchmark uh, for, for the robots in order to, to not uh, shoot too far away from what they're able to do. So she was making a big mess in our living room and I gave her the task to take a key uh, and and uh, if if and, and told her essentially that if she could uh, open the door in less than ten trials, she wouldn't have to clean up uh, the big mess she was she was doing. So I expected her back then when she was five years old that either it would work immediately or not at all. But interestingly, after seven trials, she was able to succeed. And this was roughly uh, among the same time when you know, these, these uh, images went across the globe. People were making fun of, of uh, the things that we as a community have been doing. But I think it was showing a little bit that, that manipulation is a very hard problem and that the, the sense of touch and, and the ability to, to interact with the world, but also to manipulate it really sensible, but also at high performance is still kind of a challenging task. And we see this also in, in, in this big AI debate over the last years, that many of the things we see have not yet uh, entirely um, reached uh, robotics in the sense that we could uh, achieve human level performance in the things we're doing. So obviously the, 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 the kind of complexity of manipulation of the hand, of the sense of touch, and obviously the, the way that we interact with the world 
and how we grasp it, how we manipulate it, and how we are able to learn to interact with it is still a huge, huge uh, challenge. But I think, as Alessandro said, several, um, I'm not sure I want to call it uh, breakthroughs as he did, but maybe uh, some, some steps were made that we could uh, come closer to this uh, grand challenge of achieving human level manipulation, which obviously is still far away, but uh, s several things were, were done that I think are kind of interesting to, to discuss and show. So, and also, I, I just would like to underline what Alessandro was saying, that I think it's not only industry that needs these kind of systems or where, where it could be of benefit, but also more and more professional service application and things that have not been automated before or this robotic assistance have not been kind of the standard way of, of looking at it. Just giving you an example of, a, of an experiment that, that was recently being done where uh, robots in, in dentistry are being used as an assistant. So this physical interaction and manipulation capabilities also in semi-structured environments in uh, medical applications where the multimodality of interaction is obviously a very important aspect. So, but also at the same time, the intuitive use for non-experts uh, and the safety during these kind of uh, non-standard or standardized, however, non perfectly arranged uh, situations in contrast to industrial environments. So I think it's it's very uh, safe to say that more and more of these applications occur and obviously we could discuss about many of them, but I think it's interesting that that uh, we can see more and more robots in various diverse use um, being being um, yeah, integrated and in, in, in introduced um, beyond the classical way that we as, as a community, I guess, see it in uh, industrial or uh, service uh, robotics applications, but more and more also into professional applications. So today I'm going to talk a lot about uh, interaction and, and uh, the sense uh, tactile sensation, control and learning. How do we make use of the sense of touch? Very briefly talk about safety, which has been also a lot of my, my own work, uh, in, especially during my PhD. Um, also with some work in, in industrial standardization. Um, and then a large portion of my work was going to talk about collision monitoring. How do we detect, isolate, and uh, and then respond to collisions, uh, especially also work we've been doing with Alessandro many years ago. And then uh, come to the first Q&A part. Um, and then the fourth part is going to deal with interaction control on a broad sense, especially impedance control, unified force impedance control, and how does this also bridge to telepresence and uh, multi or one, one to n uh, telepresence uh, applications with diverse embody, uh, robot embodiments in some sense. And then the last part, I, I really want to kind of uh, bridge the gap also to one of the previous IFR um, um, happenings where I think it was a lot about uh, model-based control and data-driven learning. So I think I, I would like to also share some thoughts and some results there, which might be of interest uh, to, to give a little bit of insight of how we think um, robot learning uh, could, could benefit from models, but uh, without uh, uh, kind of making this a dogmatic um, uh, discussion. I guess in the end, the, the argument will be a surprise, surprise that both uh, are perfectly needed. And, and if we use both, then obviously, uh, I would argue that uh, we can we can actually achieve more than with with just one of the approaches. Okay, so a very short, however, I think important aspect: the sense of touch. Obviously, there's multiple interpretations of what I'm saying now, but I think I'm really I want to uh, focus today, especially on proprioceptive sensing. So not so much on extraceptive sensing. Um, so meaning tactile sensing in the, in the hand or in the fingers. But I think it's important that we come back to the beginning of of, of I guess what is important in in proprioceptive control and tactile control, the talk sensing paradigm that was introduced many decades ago. Um, and uh, myself, I have been involved into that, but also uh, Gert Hitzinger at DLR many years ago, together with Alina Buscheffa, we've been uh, working on that, but they already in the 80s started together with Osama, of course, to, to introduce this concept more and more into robotics or make it familiar and uh, push this technological uh, development. So the idea obviously being that in high geared, um, uh, mechatronic devices, uh, the torque sensing at the output shaft would give us the ability to directly uh, control the output torque and really have a system that essentially behaves as a Lagrangian second order dynamical system. This being in some sense a kind of uh, a technical um, implementation, I guess, of the Golgi tendon organ. And in the robots that we've been developing so far, uh, this has been always at the core to make use of as, as accurate as possible torque sensing, model-based control, and then we build on top of that. And I think torque control, as you all know, has a long history 
beginning of the 80s being introduced and having some retrofit at Stanford, but then the artisan system from Osama, the lightweight robot technologies at DLR and so on and so forth, then the tech transfer to KUKA. And then I think what I really want to want to stress is that obviously torque control being at the core, however, being only the core and not uh, what, what I personally would, would argue to be of tactile control being really on this, on this base system um, of the torque control system, developing soft robotic systems, reflex controllers, learning algorithms, and so on, really making uh, sense out of this torque control robot platform on which we can then uh, develop more sophisticated algorithms, then ultimately designing robots that, that uh, might become tactile uh, systems. Um, obviously, many of the found the, the basic ideas and, and uh, experiments were done already in the 80s. Here's work from Osama, from Gerrit, from uh, Bruno, who has done great work in this, and many, many others have been contributing, obviously, to that. But I always love to show that because the ideas have been there for many decades. And I, th I still think that it, it's important for us in the community to, to really understand that this has been always one of the primary goals of robotics to make robots capable of interaction with the world. And that this is still something of a big challenge that uh, we still fi were fighting one of the fundamental problems. Can we design robots that simply behave as the simple uh, Lagrange dynamics that we all learn in Robotics One. And as many of us, especially the people who work in motion planning, they all uh, always are kind of on this motion uh, or position level. Then obviously in control, we really want to have systems that behave as such so that all our sophisticated algorithms can, can be uh, applied. However, there has been, uh, I think, kind of a struggle in technological terms and also in kind of uh, the fundamental framework idea being uh, questioned many times. But I think over the last decades, it has been shown that uh, building robots that really comply to this uh, ideal um, are able to do indeed several things that, that could not be done with, uh, with a traditional position control device. And I personally had the experience that this opened up an entire new plethora of, of new skills and new ideas and uh, fundamentally being uh, the, the the right way to go because it's obviously grounded in physics. And uh, I think in the end, the uh, mechanical system has to somehow physically interact with the world and needs to be aware of its own dynamics and behave according to that. So this has just in a nutshell been uh, developed towards, I think quite some maturity uh, in the sense of dexterity in the upper left, you see gravity compensation with torque control systems weighing 10, 12, 15, 17 kilogram being thrown around as if they weigh several hundred grams instead of kilograms showing reflexes uh, on, on really millisecond level far faster than humans could ever do. And then also on the lower left, you see kind of uh, assembly tests that we have been doing over time, uh, obviously going in complexity towards maybe even uh, key into whole problems, which are in the nanometer range, uh, or several nan uh, tens of and hundreds of nanometers of accuracy that you need in terms of um, uh, insertion capabilities, which obviously cannot be done by position controlled systems anymore. So these things could be then done. If, and I'm going to give some, some insights of control approaches that made this possible. Um, and I think what is also important is that uh, I showed you in the first picture that uh, the standard in robotics is still, as we all know, position controlled spot welding and painting. However, over the last years, not so many, maybe three, four, five years max, we have seen more and more applications of delicate uh, assembly insertion tasks that are now becoming industrial reality. So they are still on the, on the, in the beginning and uh, only, only have started to be, to be implemented really in manufacturing and, and, uh, uh, and in serious production. But uh, actually several of them are now running operational and I think this is a great news for robotics and especially for this whole idea of tactile control and uh, inter interaction aware uh, systems. So in order to be collaborative uh, with humans and share workspace, obviously manipulation is one part, uh, sense of touch, but at the same time, we need to make sure that the systems are safe for interaction with humans. Um, this is, I think, pretty clear that there's uh, still lots of work to do. Safety is especially important if you go to the real world, because otherwise um, <clears throat> the, the question of who is responsible is not, is not really answered. So many of the works we've been doing, uh, also my own PhD thesis, inspired by work of Osama and Antonio Biki and, and also Yoji Yamada in, in, in Japan, have been trying to answer the question, can we actually approach Asimov's first law of a robot being safe for interaction? And what happens in the worst case if a robot impacts a human with its mechanical structure? And uh, can we do something about that? So there is two major questions in this whole uh, fundamental physical interaction problem. So a robot interacting with a human physically, uh, let it be deliberately or, uh, or unintended, 
there is the control question, obviously, so it's a local question. I, the robot has its local configuration, it's impacting. You feel the, the reflected inertia of the system given the impact direction with its local curvature. But then there is also the question, not only in control, that you, that you need to modify the, the local speed of the system, but you are also interested in the question of how do I design a robot um, uh, such that it's safe, such that its sur surfaces are as little uh, or produce as little harm uh, during unintended collisions as possible. So in planning and design, so in global questions, you could call that. So I think it's very important that we differentiate the safety problem in these two dimensions. So the local imminent high-speed impact question and then the global design and planning questions that are very fundamentally different. However, both of them ask the question, how do I minimize the potential harm that I could produce on a human during an impact? that would occur. So I've been myself doing lots of impact experiments and maybe some of you still remember these nice videos. What a lot of fun to do these uh, experiments. So I was crashing everything that came to my, I mean, everybody who came uh, to my lab, I had to crash it. So it was a really very interesting PhD thesis because uh, I was allowed to break, uh, oh no, I was not allowed, but I, I was put at the risk of breaking robots that, that were very expensive and uh, it was kind of part of my work. So very, uh, kind of different from classical PhD work, I guess. So, and then obviously I've been doing lots of this uh, this impact experiment and trying to understand what's the mechanical uh, energy that transfers from the robot to the human, what potential harm could it produce? And we use crash test dummies uh, of various forms. We also, uh, I always say, this is my twin brother who then back then was still alive and uh, I did many experiments with him. Um, to understand what the fundamental uh, impact properties of, of the robots we've been developing back then could be um, and how safe are they in, 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 uh, in collisions where no safety um, the controls uh, were activated. And interestingly, uh, it came out that uh, Sammy, such collisions... Yeah? Sammy, maybe you should say that nobody should try this if it's not fully trusting his own software. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, uh, uh, but I think, uh, Alessandro, since you said it, I can just uh, confirm what you, what you just said. So nobody should do it if you don't trust your own software or if you don't have a twin brother you don't like anyway. So that's kind of the two choices, uh, I guess, you have. And I, I would have, yeah, maybe we can talk about it later, Alessandro, how I uh, flipped the sign when we first did the collision reaction and the robot was, was uh, chasing you instead of evading from the collision. But that's a different story we can elaborate a little bit later. Okay, so, but uh, I think over the course of action, it was kind of interesting that uh, over, over the time we started to understand that in fact the reflected inertia, the velocity um, <clears throat> and the, the surface of a system fundamentally can, can serve as a unified representation between humans and robots in order to understand the safety properties of the system. So we came up with a, with a concept we called safety map, which tried to bridge and be the fundamental um, uh, data um, representation that could serve for the human, uh, for the robot, and for the human, and then merge them into a kind of a, a mass velocity space in which we then see which impact energy, which masses, which velocities, and which curvatures produce safety harm, and how do robot dynamics intersect with the safety curves of the of the human body, and from this deducing how safe a robot would move instantaneously, and because these are global maps to understand how the global robot properties in planning or design would affect the fundamental safety properties of the, during such collisions. So what we see here is now a safety map that draws um, the injury coming from the frontal collisions with the, with the human head. So this is biomechanical injury data we see here. And we see the global inertial properties of a lightweight robot and a Puma 560 given impacts uh, with the frontal bone. And what interesting we see in this particular analysis of fracture of the frontal bone, none of these systems given their global properties and given the maximum speeds would fracture the very strong and very rigid frontal bone of the human uh, forehead. Obviously, this would very, look very different for other parts of the human, but just to show you that these are global maps that analyze the safety properties of robots and can give you a notion for design and planning, uh, basically a cost function of, of, of safety that could then be used for trustworthy motion planning in some sense. Okay, so the third chapter I want to talk about is going to be a little bit longer, uh, so collision monitoring. Um, so the, some of, several of the works we've been doing also was collision detection reaction together with Alessandro. Um, and Aline, uh, back then at DLR, we did the basics for that. Um, 
So uh, for fast and also sensitive collision detection and traction. So uh, on the left side, and again, I, I have to quote Alessandro, only do this if you trust your own control system and the code that you have been producing. Um, then obviously the, 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 what you see here on the left side is highly dynamic interactions and on the right side, uh, potentially very dangerous situation. The force sensor that you see there at the end effector what was only there for reference measurements. So how did we achieve these results? Um, so a couple of years ago, we pr uh, um, published a paper that tried to lump everything together and put together a framework for collision monitoring. We introduced the so-called um, a collision event pipeline that starts from the pre-collision and ends at the post-collision phase and starts from detection, goes over isolation, meaning where is the collision, then identify the, the, the time evolution of forces and, and moments, oops, sorry, and then classify obviously and react accordingly to, to the collisions. So what do we mean by that, especially by the isolation and identification problem that then uses uh, or feeds the detection? So if we go look at the standard rigid body dynamics form, then obviously the contact torques uh, in the in the joint space stemming from the uh, collisions in, in, in Parisian space being met via the, Jaco the contact Jacobian transpose are the ones we want to, to have. However, bec because we don't have acceleration uh, available typically, we cannot directly solve this equation algebraically. And uh, Alessandro has, has introduced, um, I think 2002, 2003, the concept uh, together with Kunze and the, and the generalized momentum into the uh, observation of or in the or rephrasing the dynamics in such a form that together with the residual observer of the following form i'm not going into the details but it essentially is a classical um, reduced order um, uh, um, uh, um, disturbance observer that looks at the uh, rephrasing of the uh, of the of the rigid body dynamics into the momentum, which is mass matrix times velocity, and then essentially introduce the first order system to then in the end come up with an estimation of the external torques that are the unknowns via a residual um, um, quantity we call R, and there we can show if you have a pretty good model of the system, so you know your mass matrix, centrifugal terms and gravity, you end up with an estimation that is a first order filtered version of the external torques with a constant gain, which is essentially the, the frequency, sorry, uh, the, the, the cutoff frequency of this observer. Um, and with this, essentially have a first order filtered version of the external torques in the joint space. However, this obviously depends on the on the measurements, on the frequencies, on the model accuracies, and so on and so forth. But given that, you actually end up with a pretty good estimation that is pretty sensitive and achieves the results you just saw. However, it's not only there for collision detection, but you can use this obviously also for measuring contact forces. So you see here that uh, this kind of, I mean, it's a bit extended, but however, the basis is, is similar that this method can be used to really get very accurate end effector force estimation without the need of a force sensor in the wrist. Osama will now uh, start with me a big debate, but I'm just making a point here that torque sensing can really be used together with all these methods to then essentially do um, force estimation along the structure of the system. And even at very, very uh, accurate uh, quantities. The next question we asked ourselves, can we extend this question also to branch down, so to, to, to tree-like dynamics? And um, we have been uh, working out algorithms that essentially look at various contact points along the structure with the uh, assumption that you have not only position and torque sensing in the joints, but also with uh, distributed force torque sensing. So given the setup that you could locate force torque sensors along the structure of the human heart system, not uh, requiring how many, but just with uh, integrating this into the framework. And then we recently worked out how we can essentially go with a, with a recursive algorithm from the outside of the branch into the system and then essentially uh, one by one estimate the contact points coming from uh, uh, General Jacobian that takes the external uh, torques and forces in joint and, 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 uh, and link space um, with the measurement matrix F we see here and get the recursive estimation that then can essentially be updated in the measurement matrix to then go step by step from the outside to the inside. I will just uh, do this quite quickly in order to then in the end end up with an estimation that then can be stacked and do a final sensor fusion step that essentially solves the collision detection, isolation and monitoring problem for um, uh, these tree-like structures. And uh, this is something we've been doing together with, uh, so Jonathan Fondam, PhD student of mine, who has recently completed these results. You can see some, some uh, simulation results. So on the left side, Mujuko 
We have multiple collisions on the right side. You can see how the system, uh, you can see that the simulated contact forces are estimated extremely accurately. So they, uh, whether they are always at the right place, that's a multiple uh, question, but there's some, some contact resolution. But what you see here, oops, sorry, is now a bit close up. So also the contact forces at the ground, the multiple collisions are being monitored and also self collisions. And this is all real time capable. So now we have essentially solved this, this problem, not only for static manipulators, but for tree like structures as well. Another thing we've been doing is not only for articulated systems, but I guess in biologic systems, we know this is also working for flying uh, uh, sorcerers. Um, and, oops, sorry. And we all know these videos where drones are running into trees and they basically crash and cannot uh, retract from that. And together with Theo Tomic, uh, who has uh, also uh, got uh, much appreciation, appreciation for this work, we have been generalizing this work to flying systems and using only onboard IMU measurements to essentially um, do interaction control, disturbance estimation, and also fault detection, so essentially for flying systems. The idea was essentially to do, um, based on the measurements in an IMU that are available, so acceleration and, and rotational velocity, do uh, essentially the same idea for momentum, but uh, with the particular, uh, particularities from flying systems. And then in the end, um, to make a long story short, end up with a very similar structure. So a first order filtered reconstruction of the external range, and then having uh, these systems also uh, being implemented in commercial drones, um, where you can see now that the system is running into the trees, detecting the collision, and then replanning. So this is now the internal view of the system with uh, with the according sensor measurements. So you can see how it detects the external range, estimates where it's coming from only with IMU measurements and onboard uh, current sensing, and then essentially replants its motion so that the flying system can essentially run into collisions and retract from that at high speeds and uh, quite nicely. However, there are still limitations in that. Um, obviously, if you have a first order system, you have not only thresholding due to modeling errors and, and let's say noise in, this, in the measurements, but also you obviously have a low pass filter, which means higher lag in the estimation. Ideally, you would solve both, you would like to solve both problems. You would like to increase the detection uh, sensitivity and also the, the, the time response of these systems. And something uh, we've been recently uh, doing is to, uh, to try to understand, could we somehow uh, also use the direct method where however, we typically have the problem that this ideal solution would be very simple to implement at high accuracy and high bandwidth. However, we have the problem that we don't have acceleration typically, right? So this is a well-known problem in articulated systems. So is this really not available? So we ask ourselves, can we, coming from this drone idea, can we actually port this idea of acceleration uh, measurements and IMUs into articulated systems and apply um, kind of uh, the direct method, however, not directly, but via IMU measurements, the fusion with proprioceptive sensing, meaning the position and uh, the torque in the in the joints, and then do a uh, nonlinear observer that essentially fuses these measurements to then feed a direct estimation. And interestingly, the results can be seen here with the first uh, uh, recently published uh, work. So the upper one is a true external torque measured with a high performance fourth plate with, with a very high speed. Um, then the momentum observer with this low pass filtered version you see here, then the direct measurement with very heavy filtering because otherwise it would basically be noise. And the lowest one being this new method that fuses IMU measurement, torque sensing and position sensing and then feeds it into the direct method. And we can see we can not only get as accurate as the momentum, but we can even replicate the same frequencies we see in the true external torque measurements, which was done with a high frequency uh, force plate. The second question we are asking is the thresholding. Can we improve on at thresholding? And there, I think it's very important that obviously the main thresh, the main dynamic errors in the thresholding come from the dynamics errors. So in the, in the parameters that do we, we do during model identification. So if we look at the uh, lip form of the, uh, of the Lagrangian dynamics, then obviously it's clear that this delta theta, if we introduce this error in the dynamics, is uh, what essentially produces this error torque um, being rephrased in the in the regressive form. So we just recently introduced a new observer. I won't go into the details, but just to, to, to make the story short, that can be shown to have a bounded error and, and uh, at least under certain assumptions to converge. And interestingly, the result was that instead of using, for example, uh, here on the right side, we see uh, the thicker plots and the, the ones here um, are the momentum observer with some standard dynamic errors we get from, from, from standard system identification, which are a trade-off to some extent, obviously, 
then depending on the on this signal state, you get certain errors. Let's say 10 newton meters is here now in this particular example. With the new method and the dynamic thresholding, we can see that the threshold is about one newton at the end effect of for highly dynamic motion during a collision. So we essentially now solve both problems to some extent. And I think this is an important next step in the collision handling problem. Now I would like to a short question and answer, I guess, uh, and would like to hand over to Alessandro after this first and a bit more uh, longer part, I guess, of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Sami. Um, many interesting things. So let me f first start asking the uh, panelists if Alessandro, they have. Alessandro, are you there? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you for this uh, first part, many interesting topics. So I would like to ask our panelists if they have uh, some special question for Sami for this part. Uh, I do, but anyone uh, can. I, will. Yeah, yes, I well. think we lost Alessandro or. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I can. So Cal Cal Calogero, Calogero has a question. Cosimo, yeah. could, could you say something? I'm not sure whether I hear you. Thank you, Sami, for uh, your very excellent talk so far. And uh, uh, let me summarize also some of the comments uh, which was uh, were given on the slide or uh, was looking through them while being presented. But uh, my question is actually, you know, okay. in the perspective of automation. If there is no time, questions, sorry, are, are we sure or, that Sa Sami is hearing us? Uh, I cannot uh, hear you, Cosimo. I'm sorry. In the, in the perspective, uh, can you hear me? Yes. In the perspective of the automation scientist uh, using sensors, uh, the objective is uh, uh, to develop, so let's say, excellent Stop and for a second, or? control strategies uh, uh, using existing sensors, uh, such as. Ah, sorry. Uh, sorry. Now I hear you. Sorry, I was switching. Okay. Uh, so sorry about that. Okay, I repeat. I repeat. If you, if you can hear me. I was saying that in the perspective of the automation scientist uh, using sensors, uh, uh, let's say you are showing uh, uh, the use of uh, excellent and novel uh, control strategies uh, using excellent, uh, using existing sensors such as load cells, uh, sensing forces, and torques uh, joints to achieve smart behavior. While, uh, as an example, I personally, culturally, I'm more. Uh, let's say a sensor scientist applied to automation rather than automation scientists using sensors. And uh, in, in my case, the perspective is to uh, develop radically new sensors apply, applied maybe to state-of-the-art robots and control strategy to achieve still smart behaviors, like uh, as an example, uh, distributed sensors uh, fully covering the world robot rather than uh, force uh, and torque sensors on the, on the joints. So my question is, um, in your opinion, uh, uh, as an example, having radically new technologies emulating the rich features of our skin, so not only the sensors on the joint uh, streams, but uh, uh, on the full skin, on the automation science perspective, would it be possible to achieve uh, smarter, smarter behaviors uh, going more towards the human scale uh, uh, range of capabilities. Yeah, okay. Wonderful question. I think this is obviously, uh, it relates to my comment I did in the beginning. Um, and sorry for switching off the, the, I didn't hear anyone, so I hope I didn't miss too much. Um, I think this is one of the core questions, and I'm actually my last two slides will exactly talk about this. Because, uh, for example, at TUM, we have uh, uh, Gordon Cheng there, who has been working a lot on, on tactile skins or on, on multimodal skins. Some things we also talked about when I came here was really the, how can we unify this? Because these are two modalities in a way, right? So they are not the same information. One is really in the joint. There's a dynamical system between the joint and the contact. So there's, it's not like the same. So I think one of the big questions I have is, how can we fuse this information ideally? And I... I truly believe that this is the key to, that's why I was a bit hesitant in saying uh, breakthroughs because I, and, and human level performance, because I think this is really what we need to go to human level performance. However, at the same time, I would argue that we need both and extremely tightly uh, connected and coupled, proprioceptive 
force sensing and the true tactile sensing. However, in, in robotics, I'm not so sure we need to differentiate it as, as we do in, in humans, because obviously we have uh, in some sense a bit different um, uh, way of, of looking at things. But I, uh, I think it's, it's very clear that, especially if you look at the humanoid uh, example I gave you, there it's very obvious there that you would leverage and that you could benefit from what you called, uh, I think, disruptive um, uh, breakthrough technologies and sensing that we could have, for example, the contact points for free. We could have first estimates. Um, we could have force estimates, uh, shear forces. So all this information that you could never get from proprioceptive sensing just due to its nature. So the answer is obviously uh, yes. This this is a very, very fundamental question. And I think it's not only touching the the technology, as you say rightly, but also how do we fuse this information and systematically so that we make both best out of um, let's say the, the proprioceptive uh, um, tactile sensation and the extraceptive tactile sensation and, and what are the models to bring them together. And this would be, a, a, I think, something that I will show in the end a little bit how, how we try to, to, to come to such a, let's say, unification of them for some first uh, very simple examples and uh, I'm more than happy you. to discuss this further. Thank you, Sami. Your reply was excellent in my, in my view. And uh, this confirms that, uh, you know, those two challenges, uh, uh, sensor advancements and control and automation advancement are too huge to be addressed together in a single small scale project. Uh, and yes. this is the reason why, in my opinion, we need big flagship projects applied to robotics, because in this case, we can fuse the two endeavors together towards a common goal that could mm. achieve a human scale level of abilities. Thank you. I could, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, maybe just to, 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 to even underline what you just said. I think I tried to make also a point, you know, if looking at the torque control fund, uh, paradigm starting in the 80s and have, have, I mean, just recently really reaching a level where we can say it's uh, to a certain extent. I mean, I don't I like the word soft in the way that, that often people use it, but I guess we are at the level where we can say it's it, 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 it was brought to commercial maturity. So, and I think this counts for many of the, of the sensing, actuation, and, uh, and closed loop control questions and, uh, that, that are still there. So I, I cannot agree more. It's a long-term question, not something you can do in a couple of years. It's too, too fundamental for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I have oh, a, uh, yes. Oh, I have a quick question just to actually sort of lead up sure. on that. Um, so a lot of the examples that you show your control and collision detection is working for are rigid body object manipulation or rigid body contact. Do they extend to uh, soft materials or flexible mm -hmm. interactions yeah. with like, yeah. uh, you know, with let's say like fabrics and stuff? Great question. That could be kind of the introduction to a little extent to chapter three interaction control. So I will show some examples because obviously um, the, the, the nature of, of interaction uh, spans all these dimensions. So there is obviously the, the question whether it's a static environment or whether it's a changing environment. How much do I know of the environment? It's a fundamental question. And then also, is it flexible? Is it even soft? And then is it even deformable? I mean, there, obvi and obviously this is a increase of complexity of, of orders of magnitude. So just to, to not uh, raise the expectation too high. So I'm uh, with, with, a, with, with humble, um, uh, um, ambitions. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to answer this question, maybe. Yeah, but yes, you can, you can do that. And maybe just to, to give you an idea, um, the, in the, in the estimation of the torques and in, in all of these questions, we don't even assume any, any knowledge about the environment. So it's not that we, that we assume there is a given contact geometry or contact um, dynamics, softness, damping. No assumption whatsoever. It's really just the external torques. And now comes the inverse question, right? Given the external torques. How much knowledge can I put in to actually estimate rather the context? So we are trying kind of inverting the question a bit to not do the assumptions in the beginning, but really do the assumptions in the internals of the robot where we know exactly what we're doing. Yeah. That would be my, my short answer on that. Yeah. Good. So uh, I would suggest that we go on uh, because uh, we're taking time. Uh, although I must mention that uh, in the Slido question, there are several uh, requests of being more precise in what you uh, understand under tactile. So if this is a sense of touch, and but I think that the discussion that we have with Calogero in particular uh, clarified that uh, these are two words that should come together. So yes. the, the, the sensibility at the joint is not the sensibility on the surface and tactile sensor are there also for this, but maybe these two things can be 
merge two together. Maybe later on at the end, we can uh, resume this discussion. So Wonderful. please, Sami, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the great questions. Okay, interaction control. Um, I guess this is a, a little bit kind of continuing now the discussions we just had. So, and I'm, I'm not spending a lot of time of in, on impedance control and not going into details, but I guess we all know uh, also the great work of, of Neville and the, the tremendous impact it had in, you know, as being the next level on torque control and then going to developing uh, control schemes, not only for rigid body systems, but flexible joints, variable stiffness, variable impedance, so on and so forth, to essentially render a behavior that is a second order system with respect to external contact. So really rendering mass spring damper behaviors that then could be controlled similar to how humans would do that. However, one thing that obviously is not integrated into, into impedance control is the accurate control of forces. So there is obviously two, two very different paradigms and lots of the work that we were trying to do. And this, I think, also nicely fits to the question of Andrea. How can these things be put together if we have different contexts and, and how does it uh, work with them? So impedance control, as you all know, is essentially setting up a kind of a desired mechanical behavior. And uh, here we can see how an, a compliant uh, robot is being dragged through um, a kind of mechanical maze, you could call it, without knowing the environment and just complying uh, by its mechanical behavior, obviously you need to set up the right impedance. Too stiff, it would get stuck. Too sloppy, it won't uh, be dragged through. So this is obviously kind of also related to potential fields, you could argue. But I think it's kind of showing the robustness and the compliance uh, uh, are tightly entangled with each other. And this interaction with the environment deliberately is highly dependent on this fusion of internal and external sensing. Then obviously now coming to the different contexts, Yes, we can uh, use force sensing, and I'm going to talk about force control also in a second for different materials. And you can see how the accurate, uh, a very accurate force sensing with internal uh, force control with internal uh, force sensing only up to tenth of Newton can be done for sponges, for uh, this is basically rubber and hard material, and the, uh, provably stable. So we don't need to have any assumption on the environment. It's an emerging behavior that comes from the very kind of deeply rooted in passivity energy-based control with tank uh, um, ideas to then be able to unify impedance and force control. So this is something I'm gonna talk about later, but force control uh, can, be, uh, can be done uh, also for various materials. Obviously then generalizing to more also diffusing or the, the big question being the next one, the tactile and the internal proprioception to do accurate force control being one of the fundamental questions. However, I think what also became possible now more and more is highly accurate very robust force control at various hertz. So up to three hertz, we were able for a mechanical system that has about eight to 12 hertz mechanical bandwidth. So closed loop control at quite some, some performance at rather high, uh, high amplitude. So we see here about 15 Newtons at three hertz, which I think is, is, uh, is uh, quite, quite some, some, some performance we, we were able to achieve um, in order to then really now ask the question, but what can we not do with impedance control and what can we not do with force control? So obviously, if we just use impedance control and want to apply a force on an environment, maybe just restart this video. So we typically preload a spring move and then we hope that this you know, desired behavior with the preload translate into a contact force, which obviously neglects the contact environment. So this accurate uh, resolution of force is not possible. If we lose contact, we uh, kind of release energy, and this is a potentially dangerous situation. If we have a force-controlled robot, it does the same thing. It loses contact. It basically just moves into the ground. It doesn't know how to behave there. So both are kind of lacking some robustness, but also accuracy in the same time, but in different uh, terms. And one thing we have been working on also for the last years is how can we unify impedance control and force control together? And obviously the first thing that people would do and that we also did to some extent, this work that I've been doing together with Erfan uh, for the, many years now, who has really done an excellent job here, um, is to unify, not in a naive sense, as you see here, but propose a novel force uh, an impedance controller with a PID loop and force control and unify that with the tank concept by essentially writing down a naive force controller doing some passivity analysis, detecting the so-called passivity violating ports in this uh, feed for so force and impedance at the same time that have to be compatible, and then essentially do an energy tank augmentation to get, uh, guaranteeing the stability. So this being the, the, the crucial thing to be done in order to then be robust against environmental changes and, and various compliances in, in, in the context and so on and so forth. And then introduce a, a concept of uh, contact, non-contact stabilization that doesn't depend on force sensing, but on deflection uh, and therefore being much more robust to, to, to 
instabilities and, and hard contacts. So what we uh, end up with is essentially writing down a storage function that works on the tracking error, as you can see here. So uh, kinetic tracking error and stiffness tracking error, uh, stiffness error. Uh, so potential and kinetic energy in the error. And then coming from the storage function and time evolution, we can then detect essentially the passivity violating ports, which are the feed forward force of the force controller times the velocity, the desired velocity coming from the impedance controller and the force controller, and then the desired velocity of the impedance controller and the true external forces. So these are the three passivity ports we need to look at in order to stabilize to develop such a system that then can do force impedance control simultaneously in a stable manner. I won't go into details here, but essentially you introduce three tank uh, 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 keys that monitor the behavior of the different tanks, um, give them initial energy, which is the biggest question obviously in this energy tank framework, to then let the Cartesian impedance controller and the Cartesian force controller be added under the passivity based framework with some dynamical test dynamics that look at these different uh, um, uh, passivity violating ports and then dissipate energy in case they, 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 they produce instability behaviors. The result is essentially as such. So we can now very accurately control forces, but at the same time, even uh, in contact loss, the system is able to, to respond uh, safely and accurately with dynamic environments. So we're talking about softness, but also change in environment. So the robot has no idea what happens in the environment. He's just trying to, to maintain a contact force and a, a compliant uh, motion with impedance control and lateral motion. And the same thing can also be done for highly unstable and very hard impacts. And on the upper side, we see the force error that is below two Newton uh, in the contact tracking, even for such a system. So even for highly unstable environments, the robot is able to track the contact forces despite this, this zigzaw, uh, jigsaw uh, flapping and is able to maintain the contact forces nicely. One problem that comes with that is obviously the gain scheduling of the, the energies. So one fundamental question in this energy-based control is how much initial energy budgets do I give to my tasks? So we need to not only uh, do this and then hope that the energy that we give to the system is, is, is sufficient, but it could be too low, it could be too high. So we need to make sure that this is kind of matching the task at hand that we want to do. And for this, we introduced um, a kind of an uh, what we call valve-based virtual energy tanks, which are also not only budgeting energy, but also kind of constraining the power that can flow into and out of the, the tanks so that we don't get jumps in the energy, which might be passive and uh, which might be stable in the control sense, but they might be kind of uh, jeopardizing the task at hand or even the safety of the human. So for this this is now just some image I wanted to show you. You can then even uh, introduce a hierarchy in, 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 in tanks that kind of says which task produce and, and can, can use which kind of energy. And with this kind of generalizing the hybrid force impedance or force uh, position control uh, in the 80s from Craig, uh, Craig and Raybert and Osama's work to then essentially be able to have tanks that, that look at different tasks. So what you see here is now <clears throat> a robot that is supposed to maintain a force uh, vertically to the human hand and move this mass along the slider. And if you basically then retract your hand, the robot would essentially move and you and consume the energy budget that you give it into the first priority task, which is containing or holding the, the, the hand uh, or, or withstanding the hand contact while he's moving. So if the motion kind of consumes all the energy, the robot would stop. So you essentially can, can then not only give an energy budget, but also deduce which task is to be higher priority. So it's an alternative in some sense to multi-priority control, however, still in the early beginnings. Okay, and then uh, this is kind of the, the fundamental uh, frameworks for force impedance uh, control to put them into one unified concept. And what we have been recently been doing is also, can we not only go uh, in direct control, but also in interaction control. So uh, obviously the interesting thing would not only to have this in autonomous operation, but maybe even do this force feedback and unified force impedance control, impedance control also for telepresent setups. And we started to work on essentially generalizing this to for example, flying systems and connecting this, uh, this uh, haptic interaction to various uh, um, uh, devices. And then also using not only contact branches, but also the estimation of, of, uh, of, of the wind forces to then give force feedback to, um, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the haptic devices here. And then I, I will show you soon how this also generalizes to the 
force impedance control so that you can telepresence with force impedance control to then uh, even even do coordinated control with systems. So here you can see now how these estimators can be used for also flying systems, not only articulated systems, and show very stable bilateral telepresence control uh, with multi multiple uh, disturbances or contact modalities at hand. This now generalizes also to the question of remote telepresence. So telepresence, we typically do uh, standard uh, control architectures. We recently uh, um, extended this also to the um, unified force impedance control. So what you, oh wait, sorry, this was a jump. So what you see here now is essentially um, also using this for multiple systems coming together. So coordinated control, force impedance control for, for manipulating objects, and then showing how this also can be used for, uh, for tele-impedance setups. So here, you see now two robots with the same controller essentially doing coordinated control without being coordinated. So fully distributed control, however, with the coordinated task. So unified force impedance controller to, to hold the object at high performance. And you see intentionally the contacts are with spongy environments so that we also get resonances to see how, how sloppy environments can, can, can modify the performance of the tracking. And then also what we see here is now that uh, this is a very stable uh, environment, even with this force impedance control not being synchronized at all. So the robot's really trying to get this in a very high performance setting and getting also the force feedback, as you can see, I think in the, uh, in the video, to the operator. So this is fully uh, telepresence control with unified force impedance control so that you can feel that also on the leader side. Okay, that will be my second break. And now I think I, I didn't switch on uh, the mute, so I'm, I'm more than happy to to be able to hear also the questions that might arise. Okay, thanks, Sami. Um, I, I let me collect first uh, a couple of questions that uh, emerged from the uh, remote audience. First, uh, a colleague of yours uh, is asking uh, the similarity. A very technical question: similarity of your work uh, with respect to what Etienne Bourdet has been doing. And the other question is. Uh, uh, what kind, what specific techniques uh, can be used to combine to merge effectively proprioceptive and tactile sensing, what you mentioned before? And finally, uh, sensor delicate, what about sensor redundancy and how they would impact the cost of manufacturing solution? Okay, very, very good questions. <clears throat> I hope I can answer them. So similarity with Etienne, actually Etienne and myself have been collaborating for, for a decade now, I guess. And I, in the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about also some joint work we have been doing. We just recently, again, submitted papers. So we have been lots of um, work been doing together with Etienne. So I'm going to talk about this adaptation of impedance um, that I guess the, the question is referring to, um, that uh, Etienne has also been doing, I think, with, with David Franklin. And uh, so, which is more about adaptive impedance control. So, where the the, the time where or the, the the adaptation of impedance uh, in humans has been has been studied to 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 kind of ref, uh, uh, correlate with an adaptive control error. And um, the idea was was back then. Um, in also, we worked together on a European project called Viactors. How can we transfer these insights from human? Uh, impedance control, adaptive impedance control that were on a principal statement to, to fully um, articulated systems. So uh, it's it's not a similarity. I think we have been on many things working together and also published together uh, several works on that. Um, I hope this answers the question, maybe not on the content level, okay, but sure. I think, sure. yeah. The second one, uh, the specific techniques for fusing proprioception and tactile. Yeah, I, I hmm. That is a tough one, I must say. I think, and now that I'm, I'm, I'm being quite speculative, I guess. Um, as usually in sensing, the first question is, is probably, or one of the first questions is not only the modality and the sensors, but what model can we use to connect the sensors to do a sensor fusion, right? That's also a fundamental question we might ask ourselves. And so far, um, I'm not so sure how many unified models between Lagrangian dynamics and contact uh, dynamics exist that really connect them in a, in a unified framework. So I guess this would be a, a big question I might have. And then um, probably as always, the right model um, then is, is the key to, to then do the right fusion because it's physically consistent probably, or hopefully uh, it has the right abstraction. So I guess the, 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 the big question I would have, uh, I, well, at least that we're trying to work on also is, 
um, the, the, from the contact model to what information also gets lost till, it, till we are in, in the joint space, right? So there's lots of information loss, I, I would call it. So we could call it tactile information loss. So we can go back and forth, obviously. So from, from the contact itself to the joint and from the joint to the contact and um, developing models that, that really connect this in a way that is more than just a, an approximator, I guess, but also, um, yeah, that, that, that connects them on a physically meaningful level, I think would be the main work to be done. And then I guess it boils down to all the, the first thing that probably people might use are the standard nonlinear um, center fusion uh, questions or um, algorithms. And then obviously I, I put a lot of hope into learning. So can we actually also use, if we have the right model and don't try to, to learn every taxel to, to every motor tick, uh, but in some sense on model to model, then I guess it would be interesting to see how good can we inform also machine learning to, 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 to learn these models and, and bring them together such that they uh, actually get a high performance uh, um, also on the colossal control. My, my main fear if we would just do end to end would be, I think this is a, this might be good for monitoring, but for control, we need some quality on the, on the sensing, I guess. That would be my, my five cents to that question uh, answered maybe a bit too short, I hope, uh, but at least uh, some thoughts that, that I think uh, could, could uh, provide some insight into my opinion there. Uh, sensor redundancy is extremely uh, important, obviously. Um, it's already there in many robots, right? So motor position, link side position, and joint torque are redundant. We just need two. But uh, as we all know, there's reasons why we use joint torque because of collocation and so on. The same question applies to the, uh, I was talking about using IMUs for uh, uh, joint velocity and acceleration estimation. And of, of course, the more sensors you use, the better uh, estimation you can get. Also, the position is important, right? It's not only, it doesn't help if you put an IMU in the center of the, of the, of the axis. Obviously, you need to, to know where to place it so that you actually measure the, uh, the, the right signal. Um, and uh, sensor redundancy has also lots of implications if you go to safety, obviously. So there might be reasons that are more than just performance that lead you to, you would actually want to do it. So there's other design specification that would require redundant redundancy. So, and then the, the last question, uh, the, 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 I think the last point was cost of manufacturing, sensor right, Alessandro? Yes, sensor cost redundancy. Of so, if, so if you add more sensors, uh, you get more information. Uh, you get also more robustness because sensor may be dedicated. So how do you uh, trade off redundancy of sensors with respect to costs? Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you said now you get more uh, robustness. Yes, maybe in the principle, you know, mathematical sense, that's true. But if you think about it mechatronically, that's not necessarily necessarily the case, right? I mean, you build a more complex system if you put more sensors. So it doesn't mean that you are, you are more robust in the estimation process. But in the mechatronics, it's not necessarily more robust. So this is a holistic question you have to ask. So that's, that was my point. I mean, if you if you want to have... I mean, you always need to good to be as good as you as you need, right? So if this if uh, one sensor is enough and you don't need it for safety, or some robustness question, then I think one sensor should 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 do it. If you actually have reasons to increase performance, and you can bear the cost, then you can do it. But uh, cost of manufacturing does not rely on on uh, on saying on in one system I need, let's say four IMUs or two torque sensors. Let's say one sensor on the, on the motor side, one on the link side. But the question is, how many systems do I want to build? Because the, the scale of cost is obviously about the scale of numbers. It's a numbers game you have to play, not only a one system game. So uh, the answer can only be answered if you, uh, the question can only be answered, I would argue, if you know how many of them do you want to build and uh, how complex it is, is it to, to, to manufacture them uh, in the assembly process. So, and then you can only answer this question. But I mean, in the end, um, you need to, to first get the right performance, then the safety question, and then the scale question gets the cost question. So this is not something I can just answer with, uh, to, to my deepest regrets, but I, I, I would not feel comfortable to say uh, there is a clear uh, relation that, that would be trivial, yeah. More questions from the discussant? I can, I can ask something. Awesome. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, so uh, you 
cited few time machine learning, of course, which is uh, the big topic in these years. And um, this this brings me uh, if 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 you if you go back to the um, to the observ disturbance observer that you show that uh, one one of the of the last papers that you. Uh, published and you also presented here is the one about the uh, adaptive uh, adaptive part in which you have the regressor and you to basically learn the, param the the parameter so adaptive control can always be seen as a kind of middle ground between model based and machine learning yep. uh, however there have been a lot of work uh, starting from uh, uh, slothin i think and then uh, more recently, other, a lot of other people uh, trying to understand what happens if you, instead of, uh, of the model in that regressor, you put some basis of function and then you end up with, uh, with neural networks and, uh, and whatever, but still in a provable, uh, provable way. So uh, as, as a model-based guy myself, I have to ask you the devil's advocate one, which is, uh, which is the value of having a regressor with uh, with uh, the real model inside rather than some uh, general enough basis of function. Yeah, so um, I think my, my last part will touch that. I actually had to remove the model learning uh, due to time, I guess, for the day. But uh, in this particular example, I mean, there is multiple uh, aspects that are different from classical adaptive control because adaptive control minimizes the control error. It doesn't necessarily try to, to optimize the, the accuracy of the, of the, um, of the um, dynamic parameters, right? It's, 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 a, it's a controller, it's not a parameter estimation. It's just a, a byproduct of it is that parameters are estimated. And in, in this paper particularly, we showed the, the comparison to, to adaptive control and showed that the accuracy of what, because we are delib I mean, our intention is to, to also estimate the parameter. So this is our error in a way, right? You see there it's the error between the, so here, I mean, with the, with the, uh, with the regressor matrix uh, times the, the, er the, the error in the parameters. So, and this is not the case in adaptive control. So what we end up here having is um, an accurate estimate of the true mechanical parameters in this example, or physical, I mean, this obviously would work for, for other physical domains also. I mean, it's, we, are ju we just happen to be mechanical here. So I guess the, the, um, the big question you're asking is, and this is something that still has to show, is that uh, the algorithm that you're mentioning have the same performance as we have with standard system identification. And uh, we just recently, it's still under, under, under a submission, um, we, we, we really um, were putting a hard efforts into, into trying to, to to make learning algorithms to learn these complex uh, dynamical systems. Um, but if you make it as a, as a function approximator, they seem to have a hard time. And uh, I'm gonna talk about this also in my last part on the controls lab, not so much on modeling. The other thing that you get is obviously, there's many ways to use parameters, right? I mean, if you do model-based control, there are so many things. You can do stability proofs, all these things. Um, and you can obviously have also many, especially if you go to real world, there's lots about safety and certification that actually grounds to mechanical parameters, especially if you talk about safety, right? So we cannot just neglect that just because we think we don't need it. So in the end, if you go to real world and it gets uh, about uh, uh, regulation, then this is going to be a strong argument for mechanical, inter or for physical interpretation. Having said that, I don't think that um, this must be the end, especially in, I mean, if we know something really well, we always argue for model-based. However, the things we cannot model that greatly, and especially if in mechanics, we will see more and more, the more flexible the systems get, the friction is always still uh, quite of an issue. Um, so there, there might be the combination. And obviously if you have the regressor already, well, then I would argue, I mean, if you have the topology of a robot, you basically solve 99% of the problem, maybe not computationally, but from the, fundamental uh, kinematics problem. And then inserting obviously some, some uh, basis function, sure, you could do that and I'm not arguing against it, but I think you essentially fuse already physical information and data driven, if I understand uh, correctly what, what, uh, what uh, Jean-Jacques is doing there. Um, so I guess this is, a, this is really not a, a question of one or the other, but I really would argue that if I have structure, I should use it if I, if I want to have certain I mean, if I can make use out of interpretation, why would I not do it? I, that would be my argument. And, um, 
and in the end, the accuracy that that could be achieved is so far not within reach in any of the of the machine learning uh, schemes I've seen. Typically, it's exactly as you say. You start to fuse structure and and learning to then make use out of both. But then I think this is exactly the argument that I'm trying to do. So I'm just trying to say that if you do something internally, I mean, we built the systems. So I mean, we, we would be very bad engineers and designers if we wouldn't do it this way, because then I think we would have had some other issues in our internal system development. So I would rather like to, to change my system to make it more predictable because in the safety sense, in the reliability sense, in the long-term testing and all these things, you don't want to have a system that behaves time varying because this is in some sense, I don't want to say bad engineering, but maybe suboptimal uh, engineering. That would be my, Sammy. my yeah. Sorry. Sammy, yeah. let's move on now. Because okay, uh, time sure. is running short, unfortunately. Sorry. To of push. course. No, don't worry. I'm more than happy to to discuss. Maybe we can discuss this later also. Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. It's anyways the last part. Uh, I'm not sure how long it is. Let's see. But I think it might uh, connect some bridges here. So the learning manipulation. I'm coming back to this uh, picture of or this video of of my daughter, how she was inserting the key, and uh, I think it's very clear. I saw, showed this also in the beginning. Yes, you can program a robot to do the same, right? But it takes weeks, months for an expert to do so. So you actually want to have a system that is able to learn how to do that. And the question that, that you could ask is how much structure do you need to learn such a thing? So um, I'm not sure whether Andreas or Paolo are here. So they've, during my time at DLR, they have done this great uh, Papa's experiment where they compared with Aline Sun, um, the robot uh, inserting the, uh, these, these, uh, these very tight uh, puzzle pieces. Um, and and uh, it was impressive. And at ICRA 2007, I think they showed it for the first time in Rome. Um, at the same time, you still uh, see that um, a kid with five years, so similar to my, my daughter, um, uh, is still outperforming uh, the robots to a certain extent, right? So there's many things that are still, at least at that time, were not yet uh, on the, let's call it human level performance or kid, kid level performance, not even uh, human level or adult uh, level performance. Despite this being obviously very, very uh, great uh, achievement back then. So, uh, and now comes Etienne. So Etienne has been uh, uh, working a lot on trying to understand how humans uh, modulate and learn their impedances and I had the pleasure to work with him uh, already for many years and learn from him really how, how this could be done in a way that, that we can also transfer this to, to robots and I'm not going into details, but I think it's really safe to say to, that the force feed, uh, for, um, feed forward learning and adaptation of impedance are the two crucial things we need to do in order to really mimic in a way with the technical means we have uh, the, the the way how humans uh, modulate this. This has also been done together with Ganesh Govrishenka, who is now at, at uh, CNRS in, in uh, the joint lab with, with AST and, and CNRS in, 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 uh, in Japan. So what we have been doing back then um, was introducing an adaptive controller, essentially what I just said uh, maybe five minutes ago, that is able to learn with some metaparameters that you see here that typically have to be tuned manually in order to, 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 to learn essentially the impedance profiles and the impedance behavior that essentially generalize impedance control from, from level to some adaptive uh, level. So, uh, and what we have been doing the last years was to, to take this kind of um, work we have been doing back then, the adaptive impedance controller, and then try to connect it to a skill and learning framework that then even tries to, to bridge the gap to reinforcement learning and other learning schemes to then uh, be able to learn these high dimensional parameter sets given a certain task such as a peg and hole problem and try to solve it. Um, so just to make a long story short, in the end, what you come up with is a controller, an adaptive controller that has a uh, feed forward and stiffness, so feed forward forces and stiffness adaptation, an impedance controller, and then is being fed on velocity and force level. So hybrid force impedance control, uh, force uh, impedance control, yeah, learning, <clears throat> some meta parameters that then have to be coming from some optimization process on the left side with the skill dynamics or skill process that roughly formalizes the goal of the system but doesn't give you the uh, control parameters to solve it. So on a high level, for example, inserting a, a peg into the hole would basically be set the, the, the goal uh, position or the goal pose and the rest uh, need to be learned by the system. So what we have been doing back then was essentially running that process. Uh, that's now several years ago on standard new processor, <coughs> processor story. And what you can see here is a very tight peg and hole problem with, with um, 
industrial tolerances, and the robot was able to learn within only 20, 30, maybe 60 trials max, such complex peg and hold problems, and learning the abstract impedance control parameters, and the feed forward, and the, uh, the motion uh, in such a way that in the end, even though the robot was blind, so it has no vision, so we know roughly up to a centimeter exactly where the peg is, so one centimeter tolerance, and then competing with three uh, PhD students. So I always uh, make a joke and say the upper right is a computer scientist and the lower left is an electric engineer and the lower right is a, is a mechanical engineer. And now, unfortunately, ah, wait, now it continues. Uh, and the, the mechanical engineer obviously wins. However, the robot is like a tenth of a second faster, which, which was kind of a very nice result showing that just within a matter of minutes with this framework, you could actually learn the meta parameters of the of the hierarchical control stack, such that you can reach adult uh, performance in the pack and hold problem. So just recently, uh, currently under submission, we now uh, really compared this with a deep run uh, with the end-to-end -end, uh, deep RL structure. The same idea with some uh, a little bit modified algorithm. However, essentially the same thing. This is something that Bishop and Florian Vogt is doing, and then essentially trying to compare if you have such a multi-layer structure, basically trying to merge physics and learning together and not just learning directly the torques. So here we now compare uh, essentially the, the basis functions being the torques and then learning the, uh, the, the direct controls. And interestingly, the, the, uh, the result is as follows. So with the new algorithm that we have been proposing, uh, comparing with high reps that has been there for some time, oh, sorry, with uh, this multi-layer structure together with adaptive impedance controller. On the right side, some, some actor critic algorithms. We compared five uh, deep learning algorithms. And we kind of did a, a comparison on the level that we are already close to the to the peg, so that the that the deep learner doesn't have to learn from scratch how to find the hole. Um, but in the end, interestingly, uh, only this this multi-layer structure with all these lots of model-based and 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 control learning Sorry. algorithms were, were there. Yeah. Sorry, Sammy. Can, can you explain the the acronym, which is which? I mean, so PSP, the left PSP I... is the new algorithm we have been okay. uh, developing. HiReps is, is essentially um, a standard learning algorithm coming from Jan Peters and, 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 and Hoffman's lab. And uh, Soft Actor Critic is a standard deep, uh, uh, deep learning architecture. So this is kind of on the, from left being more the, the control stack we have been showing to right where you directly learn the torques. And just let me replay that. And there you can see how he's not learning on some strategies, but more on the on the talk level, which obviously also produces this this pretty jerky, jerky behavior. The result was, and this is I think kind of important now, and that's one of my last statements, uh, that on the left side, so with this uh, PSP, which is called which we call parameter space partitioning, the the base is basically to do some proposal and then do some margin in the in the solution space to to try to be as robust as possible. Higher reps is essentially doing the same thing on the parameter space, however, with optimality being the, the, main, um, the main goal. Um, the, the cost, which is the time plus the goal reaching, so we try to minimize the time to do really high performance. Uh, in the end, they perform very similarly with a bit more robustness on the PSP and a bit higher um, or lower cost on the, on the high reps. However, if you go to all the standard uh, deep learning uh, architectures, none of them was essentially able to, to perform this task of such low toler uh, no, high to uh, no, low tolerances high demands in, 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 in nanometer scale, if you do a, a perfect key. And um, then, yeah, so this basically, sorry, sorry. Um, showing that I think this, this uh, fusing of knowledge of control and also past knowledge that could come from geometry and planning fused together seems to have really an impact in, in comparing also to the end-to-end -end -to -end approaches. Then I think what is important is how can we not only learn these tasks, but can we, sorry, I think I make this a little bit, Yes, no. But can we generalize to other questions? So the peg and hole parameters, can they solve the problem that the robot has not been seen before? So what you see here now is a robot that is supposed to insert the key into the hole with the parameters coming from the peg into the hole. But the robot is with, I think you see it, one centimeter of, of, of deviation intentionally. We, we introduce an error to show that with this strategy, even such a big deviation can be dealt with. So the robot does it for the first time, is, is successful by, by chance. Now he's again optimizing. And I think after three, four, five um, iterations, again with this example, uh, in this particular example with high reps as the, as the learning algorithm, it's able to, to then again find a solution that is able to do 
in some sense what my five-year-old daughter was, was able to do back then. So I think what is also important now is that these strategies, if you now scale the, the, the skill parameters to a new key, for example, which is pure geometric scaling, what is kind of interesting is that these, uh, these uh, skills also work for other problems. So this is a fully new key. We just scaled the geometrical parts according to the, uh, to the depth and the parameters immediately learned in this particular example. The last thing I wanted to show you is how do we generalize this to, to other keys and show how this scales. So we have just recently done over the last one or two years, some experiments where we actually have here now a robot that is trying to insert the key for the first time. Now we distribute that to multiple robots with different keys, um, connect them in some sense uh, via one-to-end uh, structure, and then let the, the robots who are all equipped with a camera just to find the keyhole, uh, which is not at the same re repetitive part as for I think, I'm not sure you can see it, but some of them are always shifted by half, a, uh, five centimeters or, or less or more. And then uh, the robots are basically trying to find the, 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 the hole. And then essentially the, 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 the learning part takes place, which is close to the, to the hole. And interestingly, if you do that, what you see here now is the internal, uh, the internal uh, representation. So the robots have all different keys and different uh, keyholes, obviously. And the successors, the success and, 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 and non-successful tasks are being lumped together. And they are all different keys than the one in the beginning. So the, the one in the front. And the only thing we do is then we try to, to essentially then use these parameters to then scale the geometry of the other keys to the ski in the in the big in the front and interestingly if you you know you, you run to the end so after, at some point the unsuccessful trials basically separate right so at some i mean there's some robustness margin and then they start to, to stop and then in the end what you see now is the the one that you this was the internal knowledge so now you see the actual experiment so here already after one or two trials the robots are successful some of them are unsuccessful and uh, what is i think kind of interesting is that um, this pretty pretty broad learning process does not take hours or huge computing. They are all on standard nukes, just local uh, processing, no big uh, efforts. And really, by by introducing uh, this uh, stack of of control, the robot is then in the end able to learn and and insert the key with all the other keys that have not been that particular key. And as I said, we scale this then geometrically and the control action seems to be such that it generalizes experimentally at least. Okay, and then the last part I wanted to, to stress because this is called tactile robots. And I, I would argue, and I would happy to discuss this a bit more, but we already had some, some discussions about that. How does this really uh, become in a way human level uh, performance? And obviously the, the fusion of, of tactile or extra receptive and inter receptive tactile information. I mean, we can make out of internal information, we can make tactile information, obviously, right? That was also part of my argument that we can use all this internal knowledge plus the, plus the models to do extremely accurate contact sensing, estimation, contact uh, point detection, so isolation, and then uh, use that for control, which I think is also something that supports this, this whole idea of bringing these two worlds even much more together. So it's not only about learning and control, but also about extra receptive and internal sensing to do high performance tactile control and learning and then just showing a very it was something we did a couple of years ago so bring together um, this uh, i think all of you, you you know the system from 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 jerry loeb so using um, a kind of a framework that fuses an impedance control tendon actuated uh, finger joint that was just for for, for purpose for for demonstration purposes and fuse it together with um, tactile sensation here. And what you see, I just started from the beginning, is a reflex control framework that depending on whether you have an, uh, a, a blunt contact or a sharp contact, responds with a reflex on proprioceptive level and unified control by the tactile sensation and the interoceptive, interoceptive sensation that are being fused on exactly what I said before, a kind of a model that we introduced to get them together and then this kind of reflex behavior plus the impedance control can can be used and i think this shows a little bit at least where things might be going the next years and uh yeah i think that's essentially what i wanted to to show you and uh, the last thing i wanted to do is obviously thank all the many collaborators and as you can see alessandro is among the the most important ones uh, but uh, also all the many people inspired my work i had the pleasure to work with all the phd students and uh, also I guess um, I would like to also say thanks to the many uh, 
uh, funding initiatives that made this uh, work possible and uh, yeah would be more than happy to have more interaction and hope this was a little bit of interest uh, to the audience thanks a lot sir. thank you sami thank you sami i would yes open for a, a small applause and uh, maybe we have five minutes uh, more to take question uh, i will start from from the from the um, uh, chat and also from slido there are two opposite questions one says so if you have tactile sensor you can replace completely four store sensors and joint or sensor and on the other side, as somebody said, well, but for human robot interaction, do you need more than joint or sensor? Why you have to go tactile? So these are two opposite opinions. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, a, that's, that's a quite some statement, the first one, I would say. Um, so I, um, I think from, a, from an, I mean, in the end, it all boils down to the equation, I guess, right? I mean, if you, if you do the right model, that was a little bit my statement. I would argue that um, that uh, from the, uh, for a controls person, I guess collocation is very important. Tactile sensing is not collocated, so therefore it would not be, as on a very you know basic uh, level of statement, it wouldn't be internal control, right? So we are talking about internal control also. So mm -hmm. just because we use uh, force talk sensing and joint talk sensing for extraceptive interaction, doesn't mean that it doesn't serve also an internal purpose. And I think we all agree, or most of us, I guess, agree that this is a very fundamental um, requirement that, that is important to, to actually do a high, high performance, low level control that doesn't even know yet what interaction means with the physical, with the physical world. So um, tactile sensation, I would argue, cannot replace that, especially if you go to internal mechanics. Um, I mean, you can produce internal, uh, or you can produce tactile sensation, right? Uh, but without ex exciting internal uh, anything and vice versa, right? So this goes in both directions. So um, I would argue they both serve a purpose and um, probably time will show uh, as always that um, the fusion of both is, is what we need. Um, I mean, I don't want to even give the argument of humans because it's always a bit odd if, because robots are not humans. So we should maybe not overstress the statement. Um, but I think from my, uh, from my experience also, um, tactile sensation still has to, to, to do the breakthrough in the way that, uh, that, uh, that we will be able to use it in a way that we get to the performance level of, of, uh, of uh, joint torque sensing, force torque sensing. Um, and I think, as I said, I, I, I'm, I'm one of the persons who really truly be, not only believes, but even if you boil down the math, it's pretty clear that many things in the joint, I mean, the, 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 the contact space is not uh, the generalized uh, joint space, right? So there is many things you don't see in joint space that you see in the contact space and vice versa. And uh, along this argument, uh, including collocation, including speed, including complexity, right? I mean, if you wanna do low level control, you try to minimize also the complexity in order to go at high rates. And if you wanna do high rate, high performance control, that's also a technological question. So. That would be, um, I guess, it's a, it's a, it's a intentionally uh, 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 challenging or, or, or what is it? It's, a, it's intentionally a question that is probably uh, very uh, polarized. But I guess uh, that's kind of my 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 my, my uh, reply on that. Um, the other the other side, I think, is is a very good question. Um, I asked this myself also many times. Um, but I think the answer is roughly the same. Um, I can really see that what we can do with force torque sensing and joint torque control is, I guess, what I what I showed today, plus X, but I don't think that, the, or let's call it delta, but I'm not so sure that the delta will grow towards human level dexterity and, and manipulation capabilities. I would be very cautious about that. So uh, obviously, depending on what you call, uh, interaction. I mean, there is so many things we have not done yet. So all this delicate interaction, if we, if we think about um, very sensible uh, force uh, exchange between humans and robots, we have only scratched the surface, I would, I would argue. And um, I mean, just taking someone by the hand, um, someone who's not a roboticist in a, in a, in a way that, I mean, think about rehabilitation, think about 
uh, elderly uh, think about children. I think there are still a lot of things that we need to explore. And we just have, I mean, the I guess the question is, is, is also for physical human robot interaction. Um, if the Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what is the, uh, why would we not need it? I don't know any argument, why wouldn't it? I mean, it would be like me saying we don't need cameras. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm always still puzzled by the challenges in computer vision, but I think it's just because it's so, so that hard. And that's why we, that doesn't mean that we don't need it because just we can do something today doesn't probably necessarily mean that in the future we won't have, have great, uh, great ways and so far always the more sensors the more you can do typically the more information the more you can do the only thing that you want to typically have if you have a complex system to be integrated is that uh, you don't spend your time all the or you don't, don't all the time spent by repairing right you want to have some level of maturity and use of the of the fusion and then sensor fusion has seldomly turned out into into a bad idea i would i would argue so both questions with just a different view on the on the same answer. Okay, okay. I think that uh, Mike and uh, Zhao may have some additional questions. So, uh, actually, I have uh, very quick. I mean, many questions. And uh, first yep. of all, I uh, thank you very much for a great talk, and I'm very impressed by thank your you. recent, like uh, our progress with many videos. Uh, I have actually many questions, but I will. I have just one for now. So when I looked at the uh, force impedance control, mm -hmm. so you are achieving that like force control at the same time as impedance control. And uh, I saw that when the object is removed at the bottom and still can maintain the height. So uh, in my opinion, what that means is that you may lose some sensitivity for force control because uh, you may have some drop, but you cannot control the uh, contact force as you wish sometimes because of the impedance control. So you may, you are having some trade-off between two. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good question. And, and uh, I, I think I, I just wanna say that I'm, I'm very lucky that I have great PhD students who actually do the, the real work. So um, they do the great, so I'm just the one who can, who's, uh, who has the luck to, to be able to talk a little bit about that. Um, so the trade-off question, I guess, is, is important. Um, it's, it's a good um, way of phrasing it, I guess, because there is not maybe a trade-off, it's more a choice, I would say. Um, in, the, in the sense that um, the, the, um, the force impedance controller, um, in a way, tries to not let them fight against each other. And, uh, so, and this would mean a trade-off in, in the sense that you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. But intentionally, um, the design is such that obviously coming from, I mean, whether you want to push into a direction or whether you want to move into a direction is typically a deliberate choice, whether it's more force control or whether it's more impedance control, right? Mm -hmm. um, in this, in this respective. So that's one thing that is important. So the choice of coordinates and the choice of control inputs, that's, that's a very good point. So this choice resolves that part of the trade-off that you're mentioning. That's, that's a good point. The second one, I guess, is the, the loss of contact, where you said it's a trade-off. It's, it's, um, it, we, we designed it as follows. Um, in a way, um, the idea was to say, how, what kind of information can we get into the controller that would tell it that whatever you're doing here, there is supposed to be a contact, but you are allowed to, to vary in the contact height. Um, meaning that we introduced one more um, control variable that is the pers or that is the expected, um, let's say, contact uh, height variation. Okay. Right? okay. So the robot uh, is trying to to maintain the the performance that it can do, but um, under the the assumption that there is a, a, a kind of a delta in which it's allowed to to go up and down, right? And uh, this is to be chosen. And the idea, why did we do that? Maybe the, the design rational is interesting on that uh, level, was as follows. If you have a, um, a um, let's say a, a stereo camera system or a two and a half D sensor or whatever, so perceiving depth, the idea was that so, uh, up to the, let's say the accuracy of the visual sensation, that could be an input to a controller if you want to fuse 
visual uh, perception, meaning depth in this example, and let's say the contact uh, um, uh, task, so that they can, again, come into this fusion question. We have not done it yet, but that was the, that was the reason why we thought this would be the right way. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is also that people typically have an easy time to, to, to select that because the process is geometric, uh, geometric um, control parameters are typically easy to set. So, so it's, it's not, uh, I, would, I would argue, it's not a trade-off, it's more like a careful design process. And if you do it wrong, then it becomes a real trade-off. That is actually, of, of course, the, the case. Does this roughly answer or yeah, yeah, do yeah. you? Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. So, so, so let's say so you are yeah. using audit of information of environment. Yes. Exactly. Parent, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or we do so a worst case assumption. Yeah. Sammy, Sorry. Let's have Mike do the last question so that we have running later. Sorry. And great talk. I don't have a question, but I have uh, excitement uh, of your slide next to the very last. If you can move one slide back. Uh, Oh, no, the other one that where you have the fingertip, yeah, uh, that that retract very quickly to a sharp force. Um, yes. So your work using torque information, especially the acceleration through IMU, we, then you are able to measure the disturbance torques when the robot arm touches the ground, which you showed earlier. And I think that technique combined with the tactile sensing could enhance quite a bit on the dynamic manipulation. So one of the things that we already learned before is that when one finger holding an object at the change of a contact state where object is about to slip, that detection actually bearing a very high frequency oscillation signals between the object at the surface. But the measurement of those signals are very difficult. What I'm thinking that if we could use your acceleration measure disturbance torque technique to apply to the contact of finger surfaces, and that would really be some area that we can see dynamic uh, uh, manipulation. So it's just an inspiration. I, I think that there will be a tremendous of uh, uh, areas where we can go into more granularity, looking into the grasping uh, in beyond just the robot arms, if we, we could. So, so that's something that I hope I will have more chance to communicate with you later on, perhaps with your students as well. OK. Thanks, Mike. Very, very good inspiration. I will, uh, we try to, to follow your, your, your advice, of course. Okay, Andrea. Uh, yeah, quick question. So, right, so my background is in uh, motion prediction and, and uh, motion planning, but I do worry about control too, because the quality of the control performance for a lot of my, the robots that I work with does depend on the quality of the motion plan that we feed in as a reference trajectory. So my question for you is, um, when designing these robotic systems that interact with the world, how much of a robot's interaction with the world should be anticipated during a motion planning type procedure uh, versus treating interaction more as something that the robot needs to robustly react to? And so how do you kind of view those, those two uh, parts of the, of the problem? Okay, that's, um, yeah. So, so intentionally, I didn't talk about motion planning today because obviously I'm, I'm, I'm more a, a, a kind of, I have a only limited insight into, into, um, into the state of uh, where we are at the moment. But I, I always thought that um, prediction is extremely important, especially in interaction, because at, at least if we say the world is, is, uh, is not always the same, or we just re revisit the same world over and over again, where maybe planning and prediction are essentially the same thing then. Um, I think especially in interaction, um, when the world is changing, I mean, I think Mike just gave a great example of, of grasping. I mean, grasping is a perfect example of where prediction and 
and you know just the pre-shape let alone right it's not even about the control yet but the pre-shape is a, is a fundamental thing to be done especially if you go dynamic um, and then same thing there if you i mean everything has dynamics in a way right so the more dynamic the environment the more you need to rely on prediction because otherwise your adaptation process cannot cope with these high dynamics of interaction so you cannot you cannot um, assume that at the incident of this interaction your system might be fast enough to do what you want it to do right so just because of the dynamics of the interaction that that's something that happens a lot colleagues of mine did that a lot when when uh, they they tried to do catching of objects thomas wimberg who left robotics many years ago unfortunately i always think he would have he would have probably advanced this a lot um but he was always really telling me how much he had to to prepare the robot to be able to catch and i think this is a very very important aspect and i think the more dynamic we get <coughs> sorry the more dynamic we get the more we will see that so it's just the, the demand will increase tremendously would be my uh, my guess yeah. okay before uh, thank you andrea uh, before they kick us out of the room uh, let me thank again uh, sami uh, the discussant all the remote participants, the many remote participants, and of course the organizer, IFRR, for this wonderful idea, and uh, Usama Khatib, uh, who's behind the scene, always uh, overlooking the well-functioning of the event. So thank you, thank you very much again, and uh, till the next uh, event of this kind. Thank you, Sami, again. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me.